This is the section on jet engine starting. Why is there a starter motor on a jet engine? Well, it's there. Its purpose is to get the engine from not spinning at all, zero RPM, to above its self-accelerating speed. And of course you're going, well, Mr. Johnson, what is self-accelerating speed mean? Well, that is such a good question. Let's say that we have a really badly drawn RPM gauge or tachometer. And we'll start at 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. And of course, these, this is in percent. So here's 20, 40, 50. We're going to say 50 is idle. It's a generic number. Some engines idle at 40. Some might idle at 60. It varies. And of course we'll say red line is at 100. A jet engine is starting is a lot different than it is for a piston engine. A piston engine its self-accelerating speed is about 50 or 100 RPMs. That is when you turn on the starter on a 172, a Cessna 172, or your car, uh, you squirt in the fuel and the air and make sure the ignition's on, and it starts accelerating from a very, very low RPM up to idle right away. Of course, idle isn't very fast. In fact, one could argue that idle in a recip is probably only 15 or 20 percent of its red line, and in a jet engine, idles at nearly half or close to half of the red line. You need to understand that there are two different things that are helping accelerate the engine. The first thing you do at zero RPM is you turn on the starter motor and the starter motor is adding energy to the spool, to the shaft. So if we've got our jet engine there's going to be an accessory section and a shaft coming from to the from the accessory section to the shaft and there's going to be the starter motor and it's going to be giving energy to the main shaft of the engine spinning the compressor the compressor blows air in and instead of turning on the fuel and catching it on fire right away when the engine's at a low rpm we're going to wait we're going to wait till about 20%. That's a generic number, but it works pretty good on the test. If we started at zero RPM and we squirted in the fuel and caught it on fire, the, and there was little or no airflow going through the engine, the temperature inside of the combustion chamber would get too hot. So we could actually damage the engine by turning on the fuel right away. So literally, we don't turn on the fuel and the ignition system until about 20%. At about 20%, we're going to turn the fuel on, and the fuel's going to burn. And, of course, while the fuel is burning, it's going to accelerate the gases going across the turbine. The turbine's going to extract energy, and it's going to help spin up the compressor. In the meantime, we leave the starter on. We, I'm going to say that again. In the meantime, we leave the starter on. You'll notice that I've got this blue line. That's representing the power from the starter motor going to the shaft, main shaft of the engine to get it to speed up. This red line right here is representing the power being given uh, off by burning fuel to spin the engine up faster. And you'll notice between 20 and 40 percent, they overlap. If the self-accelerating speed of the engine is, say, uh, 35%. If we let go of the starter motor before 35%, let's say we got it up to 30 or 32, and we let go of the starter, even though the fuel is burning, the engine, the, the uh, RPMs would stagnate. We'd have a hung start, and the engine wouldn't speed up anymore. The self-accelerating speed, the definition of the self-accelerating speed, is that engine RPM at which the engine will accelerate by itself up to idle. 
the art the self accelerating speed is the engine RPM at which without the starter, that is by itself, just the fuel burning, the RPMs will continue to speed up to idle. Now you'll notice that there's an there's uh if the self accelerating speed is thirty five percent, we're actually going to keep the starter on a little bit longer. The reason is that for two reasons. One is the self accelerating speed is going to be for that particular day is going to be based on the temperature of the air, the pressure altitude, uh, how well the rest of the engine is working, and we want to have a little bit of margin. So if it was exactly at 35% and we let go at 34%, we'd be pretty unhappy. Maybe the issues that day because of low pressure altitude, high temperatures, self-accelerating speed that day is 36. We don't want to let go at 35. So typically, what's rather interesting is I've never seen a jet engine for a pilot operating handbook publish the self-accelerating speed. They only publish the speed that you get to let go of the starter. So you're going to engage the starter at 0%. When you get up to 20%, you're going to turn on the ignition, and then you're going to turn on the fuel. So now you have not only the energy from the starter pushing the engine to higher RPM, but you also have energy from the fuel burning and spinning the turbines and spinning the compressor, trying to get the engine up to idle. And then above the self-accelerating speed, that's when we're going to let go of the starter. So you're not going to let go of the starter until you're above the self-accelerating speed. Wow, and that's kind of what the starter is for. Here's an interesting chart. This is a graph that has time and it also has RPMs going up. And it also has this dotted line is temperature. So temperature on the dotted line. Here's zero RPM. We engage the starter. At some point we turn the ignition on and turn the fuel on. We'll say that that's about 20 percent. The engine's going to catch on fire and when the engine catches on fire, look what happens to temperature temperature rises very rapidly. Now what they ought to be showing is that this acceleration RPM ought to be getting a little bit steeper. When the engine here, right here, is self-accelerating speed, here's the RPM for self-accelerating speed, and here's where we let go of the starter. So there's an overlap here. After we get to self-accelerating speed, we continue the RPMs up before we let go. You'll notice that the temperature gets pretty darn hot. Here's idle RPM. temperature goes up and it finally stabilizes typically a few seconds in time after we've gotten to idle. There we go. The starting cycle. During the engine start the there's going to be two factors that are going to could negatively affect the engine and one is time and the other is temperature. Let's take a peek here at this chart. It's time across the bottom and here is temperature. And during engine start, if we let it get too hot, if we let the exhaust gas temperature get too hot for too long, we're going to damage the engine. Now right here is 525 degrees Celsius. Anywhere below that is okay. That's normal. However, if during start, if during start, if you plotted time versus temperature, and the temperature came up and it finally went down then we're in area A that is we went above 525 degrees Celsius if you look in the chart for area A it'll say determine what you did wrong and don't do it anymore like maybe you let go of the starter too soon or you put in too much fuel if you can determine what you did wrong you don't have to do anything you'll notice however also that you can have a temperature above 
this temperature right here is 595. And if the temperature comes down before you hit 5 seconds and you're still in area A, then all you have to do is determine what you did wrong or what maybe you didn't do it wrong. Maybe the fuel control squirted in too much fuel. And if you can figure that out, you don't have to do anything else. However, temperature comes up into area B because you exceeded 595 degrees Fahrenheit or Celsius and you did it for more than five seconds. So now area B you have to do a visual inspection. You're probably going to have to have a mechanic come out and look in the engine and see if any, especially the exhaust, look at the turbine section and see if anything bad happened. If you didn't find anything bad happened, you're okay. Also, if you had a really, really high temperature for a really short period of time, and of course this temperature right here is 630 degrees Celsius, and so this is area B as well, same thing. You'd have to do a visual inspection. And if everything's okay, you can try it again. If you find something wrong, you'll have to fix it. Whoops. Oh, well. If we start the engine up, temperature goes up, and we've exceeded 630 degrees Celsius for more than that five seconds, and now we're in area C, Area C, that starts to be bad news, and that's where you have to disassemble the hot section of the engine. That's the combustion chamber and the and the uh, turbine section, and you have to inspect it. Wow, look at that. This distance right here is five seconds. So you could ruin the do something bad enough to the engine that you'd have to disassemble it and inspect it in only five seconds. Wow, five seconds. Then of course, if for some reason the temperature goes really high and it goes past 800 degrees Celsius for this particular engine, this this is uh, this is repair for sure. Repair slash overhaul. Uh, you've definitely damaged things. You're going to have to replace parts no matter what. It's not just labor taking the engine apart and maybe replace some parts. It's labor to take the engine apart, and you're going to take uh, the engine apart. Now, what's rather interesting is if you look back at this slide right here, you'll notice how fast does the temperature rise across time versus temperature. what could actually happen what could actually happen is <laughs> so guess what you're going to want to do before 595 degrees before 595 degrees you're going to want to do something about it so the temperature stays in uh, either normal or doesn't leave area because area A, you could just do visual inspection on the engine. If the temperature did go too high and exceed uh, one of these lines, that's called a hot start. And I'm going to talk about hot start more here. Now, that chart that I just had up there is time versus temperature. And you'll notice that if we brought the temperature up and came back down right away even though we reached a reasonably high temperature if uh, if it didn't last too long it was going to be alright so the length of time, the length of the cycle the length of time that it takes to get this engine started is going to be very important and how, what temperature it gets up to is very important so the longer the time the worse it's going to be for the engine, and the higher the temperature, the worse it's going to be for the engine. Now, on a piston engine or a reciprocating engine, 
is you turn that key and as soon as it starts making noise, vroom, you let go of the key. Your whole life, you started pissing engines in cars. As soon as the car start, engine started making noise and the fuel caught on fire, that is you lit it off, you got the fuel can running on fire, you let go of the key when you've flown a 172 or a Seminole. It's your whole career flying those airplanes. As soon as the engine starts making noise because the fuel is burning, you let go of the starter switch. But you need to remember that on jet engines, not only do we need the fuel to add energy, but we need the starter to add energy. We're actually going to hold the starter on until 40%. The fuel and the, the ignition and the fuel we're going to turn on at 20 and that's going to get us up to 50 percent idle. You'll notice that at 20 percent when we turn on the f ignition and the fuel and the engine starts accelerating a little faster than it was before of course if we have an exhaust gas temperature gauge and say here's the starting red line this needle is going to move really fast for a short period of time, especially right in here. We're going to have a really fast rise in EGT. We cannot let go of the starter. The starter motor is very important in that it's adding energy all the way up above the self-accelerating speed, in this case to 40%, to help accelerate the engine. You need to understand that the only thing keeping the engine cool during start is spinning the compressor. I can't uh, be more adamant about that. During the starting sequence, the only thing adding energy to the en to correction, the only thing keeping the engine from getting too hot during start is spinning the compressor. There's two ways to spin the compressor. One is the starter and the other is the flame burning and accelerating air across the turbine. We've got to have both of these. First it's just going to be the starter motor so we can get this compressor spinning so we can get some airflow through the engine so we can ignite the fuel and have plenty of cooling air in here so we won't melt the turbines when the gases go across the turbines. Now that we've got high velocity gases going across the turbine, the energy from the turbine also helps drive the spool, drives the shaft, which also helps spin the compressor so we can get some more cooling air. And we need both the energy from the starter motor and the energy from the fuel to get the engine up to idle. If we let go of the starter motor, if we turned on the fuel, the ignition and the fuel at 20 percent, and then we let go of the starter motor, then we wouldn't have enough energy going to spin the compressor and we wouldn't have as much cooling air going into the combustion chamber so the temperature we'd have uh, we'd have less cool air mixing with the hot combustion gases the temperature hitting the turbines would go up the EGT would be showing that it would be rising and it would be so much easier to go past the red line on start so we've got to make sure that this compressor is spinning as fast as possible accelerating as fast as possible during engine start so we can have as much cooling air as possible. Literally, the worst thing you can do to a jet engine is to start it. We're going to go from a really, really low temperature, say 15 degrees Celsius, to maybe uh, you know 800 degrees Celsius. Well, on that engine we were looking at, maybe go to 500 degrees Celsius, and we're going to do this in you know three to ten seconds. The temperature is going to rise. When we turn on this fuel right there, it's going to go from 15 degrees Celsius and over the course of a few seconds it could be 500 degrees Celsius. We're really stressing out those the turbine section quite a bit during start. This is actually the worst thing you can do to a jet engine is to start it. The problem is it doesn't run very well without starting it. So we're going to have to do this terrible thing over and over and over again. And we're going to try really hard to mitigate the issues with heat. So we're going to try to make sure that we're going to spin that compressor as up as fast as possible. We're going to accelerate the engine to accelerate the compressor so that we'll have the most amount of cooling air as possible during engine start.
So unlike a piston engine where you let go of the starter switch, as soon as it starts making noise and the fuel gets burning on a jet engine, you must op or keep your finger on the starter motor while the engine, uh, once you've turned on uh, the ignition and the fuel and it lights off and starts making noise, you've got to keep your hand down on the ignition switch. Since we want to accelerate that compressor as much as possible, we want a really, really good, powerful starter motor, and of course it's going to use up a lot of power and develop a lot of power to do that. And starters are attached to the accessory gearbox. I think I got a picture here next. The accessory gearbox. Also called accessory section, it means the same thing. Here's a big turboprop. It's a T56, is the military designation for this engine found on C-130s. Here is uh, here's the propeller gear reduction box. Here's the accessory box. So the starter motor is going to be geared into the accessory gearbox, and the accessory gearbox is going to be geared into the main engine shaft. And so during start, energy is going to be produced by the starter motor and given to the shaft. So the shaft spins around, and of course, right here is the compressor. If you have a single spool, obviously the starter is going to have to spin around that one shaft. So if you've got one RPM gauge, the starter is going to be working on that one single shaft. However, if you have a multi-shaft or multi-spool engine, say for instance this engine has, uh, here's N, uh, N2 compressor and N2 turbine, and then of course the N1 compressor including the fan and the N1 turbine, the starter motor is going to drive N2. So the starter motor gives power to the accessory section. The accessory section gives power to N2. Now as we start burning fuel in here, well actually even before we turn on the fuel, just the compressor blowing air through the engine the N1 compressor, the N1 turbine will extract some energy out of it and N1 will start to spool up just a little tiny bit and then of course when we turn on the fuel and the ignition and get it burning and blowing air across the turbine section even more not only of course will N2 speed up but N1 turbines will extract energy and N1 will spin up but N2 will spin up first and spin up faster because that's where we're hooking our starter motor to the accessory section and the accessory section is going to be hooked up to N2. There's a lot of things you can hook up to this accessory section in addition to the starter. Uh, this is typically where the oil pump for the engine is. And of course we know how important the oil pump is. Fuel pump, same thing. We're, we need to convert some rotating energy off of the engine, some horsepower, into uh, pumping fluid around, whether it's oil or fuel. Uh, the fuel control is typically bolted to, if, if it's a hydromechanical, it's going to be bolted to the accessory section. Usually if you got the engine and the shaft comes off of the engine to the accessory section, this would be the fuel pump and then here we'd have the fuel control unit so the fuel comes into the pump, the pump kicks the pressure up runs it into the fuel control unit and then the fuel control unit runs it into the uh, combustion chambers and of course you can put a hydraulic motor on it you can put generators on the accessory section and some engines the uh, sensor for the engine RPM goes to the cockpit and it's geared connected to the accessory section and the accessory section is taking RPM off of the engine. So it's common to have a lot of things hooked up to the accessory gearbox, the accessory section on a turbine engine. Okay, on the test I'm going to ask you this question. The question is going to be uh, list the generic starting checklist for a jet engine and write it verbatim, that means word for word, and write it in order. So I'm telling you in advance, this is what it is. Can't draw circles as well as I used to.
Okay, the first thing you're going to do is engage the starter, starter on. So the RPMs are going to start rising. So the RPMs start rising. Like I said before, for generic purposes, we're going to say that at about 20%, you're going to turn the ignition on, and then you're going to turn the fuel nozzles on. The reason I underlined the word nozzles is because people are always saying, turn the fuel on. Well, turning fuel on could mean that you're turning on a boost pump out at the wing. That doesn't... what you you need to understand is that this checklist step where it says fuel nozzles on is talking about getting fuel to get squirted out of the nozzles inside of the engine. So if we've got a fuel nozzle there's going to be some valve somewhere and we need to be able to rotate that valve so fuel starts squirting out of the engine. Now if we reverse this and put fuel nozzles right after starter, if at 20% we turn on the fuel, some of this fuel, it's not going to burn, if the ignition's not on, it's not going to burn, and some of the fuel from the nozzles is going to puddle down at the bottom of the engine. If now we turn on the ignition, we're going to have flames in here, we're going to have an internal fuel fire. So we're always going to need to turn the ignition on prior to turning on the fuel nozzles. So okay, so at 20% we turn on the fuel nozzles. Whoops. At 20% we turn on the fuel nozzles and not only do we get power from the starter spinning the engine up to a faster speed, we're now also going to get power from burning fuel and having the fuel run across the turbine blades. Now at this moment right here, essentially these three steps are occurring one right after the other at 20%. When you reach 20%, this is a generic number, obviously it's going to vary by engine and you'll read that in the approved flight manual, but we'll say 20%. You're going to turn on the ignition switch, you're going to flip a lever to make sure that the fuel starts squirting out of the nozzles, and then here is the most important step in the uh, starting checklist. You're going to monitor the EGT. You notice it doesn't say check, it doesn't say take a peek, Monitor means that from now on you're going to be keeping an eye on the exhaust gas temperature gauge. So now during start you're going to be looking at two gauges. There's going to be that starting red line and the needle's going to be moving up. And not only are you going to be watching the RPM to see what's happening, you're going to keep one eye on the EGT the whole time. So that's what I mean by the word monitor is that you're going to start looking at it and you're going to keep looking at it the entire rest of the start. This is not the only time but this when you first turn on this fuel right here just at 20 percent that's the most likely time to have a hot start if the fuel control squirts in too much fuel at that moment compared to not enough air being pushed through the engine by the compressor then the temperature could rise higher than normal that's not to say this is the only time you could have a hot start but this is the most likely time and of course you don't need to monitor it before then because it's not burning fuel and the temperature's not going up okay so you've turned the ignition on, the fuel nozzles get turned on, the fuel starts burning, the EGT starts rising, and you're monitoring that EGT to make sure the engine doesn't get too hot. Then at the right time, so during this 20 to 40 percent, you're going back and forth waiting for it to get to 40 and you're monitoring the EGT, you're going to turn the starter off at 40 percent. That is, you're going to do it above the self-accelerating speed and now the rest of the time up to idle the only thing that's accelerating the engine is the fuel burning and accelerating gases to blow across the turbine blade to give energy to the compressor so you'll be able to let go of the starter um, the ignition you really only needed the ignition on for a few seconds to get the fuel lit but we're busy when we turn on the ignition and turn on the fuel nozzles we're definitely going to not have to want to worry about what the ignition switch is doing so we're going to monitor the EGT uh, if the ignition runs for an extra 10 or 15 seconds whoop de doo it doesn't make any difference finally after by the time we've got to the 40 percent if uh, it's the likelihood of having a hot start is removed so we can divert our attention momentarily to turn the ignition off also there's a lot of airplanes where they hook the starter switch up to the ignition
so you don't actually have to turn on a separate ignition switch you just arm the ignition so that whenever the starter is on the ignition is also on so it's very typical for when you turn off the starter the ignition comes off with it okay the engine is still accelerating up to idle you can now check for oil pressure just like in a piston engine you don't need uh, it to get up to the green arc within 30 seconds but you do need that oil pressure gauge to at least have started moving within 30 seconds and then the last thing you're going to do is you're going to make sure that the RPM of the engine has come up to idle until the engine RPM gets to idle the starting sequence is not over so here's the test question and then I'm just going to have eight blanks. Interestingly enough, whether it's an auxiliary power unit, whether it's a Pratt & Whitney PT-6 on a Beach 1900, whether it's a GE-90 on a Boeing 777, whatever kind of a jet engine it is, no matter what, there's going to be these eight steps and they're going to be in this order. Now I suppose the ignition turning it off and checking the oil pressure you could reverse those and it wouldn't make much difference as long as you check the oil pressure within 30 seconds. But whether it's an automatic sequence run by the computer or whether it's a complete manual system that's operated by you, here are the steps that occur for a jet engine start. The rest of your career when you start a jet engine, whether you're doing it or the computer is doing it, all of these steps are going to occur and they're going to occur in this order. So I encourage you to learn this, these eight steps verbatim in order. There are several different things. There's more than this list, but these are pretty typical common causes of the engine not accelerating during start and why that would occur. Uh, we'll get to it here shortly, but there's typically two kinds of uh, starter motors that you can use to get a gen engine running. Whoops. One of them is a DC starter generator, and you can get power from either the battery or from a ground power unit, a battery cart, and if the batteries are low, the one in the airplane or the ones on the cart, then the starter motor won't develop enough horsepower to spin the compressor around and speed it up as fast as we'd like. The other kind of starter is a pneumatic starter, that is it runs off of compressed air and the same thing there if your APU, your auxiliary power unit on the airplane or your ground power unit on the ground isn't providing enough pressure then the starter motor won't be getting enough air and it won't develop enough horsepower to get the compressor spinning around fast enough. It could be the starter. If it's a DC starter generator, maybe it's not converting the energy to electricity very, from electricity into horsepower very well, or something could be wrong with a pneumatic starter. It's not converting that compressed air into horsepower very well. Um, you got to understand, besides the starter motor, the fuel burning in the combustion chamber is accelerating gases to run across the turbine to spin the compressor. So if you're not burning the right amount of fuel, say too little, then the engine won't speed up as fast as it needs to either. The reason I put asterisks next to faulty operator is this is the most likely cause is the person doing the engine start is not doing it correctly. The classic example uh, is that you as a piston engine operator driving cars and piston powered airplanes is whenever the engines light it lit off or gotten lighted off if whenever you've got the fuel caught on fire you let go of the starter switch but now in jet engines you have to keep holding the starter switch down even though the engines lit off and so you gotta get over that and make sure that you hold the starter button down until you're supposed to let go of it There are several problems that could occur during start. Those problems could be a no start, or another name for it is false start. Uh, essentially, during the starting sequence, or let's put it this way, the uh, definition of a no start or a false start is, quote, during start, comma, the fuel 
does not catch on fire. During start, comma, the fuel doesn't catch on fire. There's two basic reasons for that. One of them is you're not squirting any fuel into the engine, so obviously it can't catch on fire. And the other reason is that the ignition system is not working correctly, and although there's fuel, it doesn't catch on fire because there's no ignition. Now, if you have this problem, then you're going to have to do something about it. If you, during that engine start, If you, during that engine start, of course, you're going to be watching the EGT gauge, and of course, you're going to be watching the RPM of the engine, but fuel flow. If during that engine start, you see the RPM starting to rise, and it gets to 20%, and you turn on the ignition, and you turn the fuel nozzles on, and the EGT, EGT doesn't rise, and the fuel flow stays down at zero as well, then that's a good indication that fuel's not getting squirted into the engine. So you don't have to really worry about a puddle of unburned fuel in the bottom of the engine. However, if you did try an engine start and you got a no start or a false start, and as the engine got up to 20%, you turned on the ignition, you turned the fuel nozzles on, and the fuel flow rose up to what it normally would for start, and the EGT still didn't rise, then you could probably have a puddle of fuel in the bottom. So typically, if you have a no start or a false start, and I was drawing this here actually for a purpose, is that if you've got this puddle of fuel down here, uh, when you try to start the engine the next time, if you turn the ignition on, this puddle of fuel will catch on fire. And of course, internal engine fires aren't really good for the engine. The temperature in here will go up a lot hotter than it should. So what do you have to do? You motor the engine. Motoring the engine means that you don't that you make sure the fuel is off so you don't have to worry about temperature. The ignition is off and all you do is crank the engine around with the starter. That's what motoring the engine is. You motor the engine by spinning it around with the starter motor, but you don't turn on the ignition, and certainly you do not turn on the fuel. What you're trying to do here is evaporate the fuel so it gets blown out the engine so that when you try the next start, it won't catch on fire. And it typically may say, motor the engine for 30 seconds, and then it may say, wait two minutes to let the rest of the fuel evaporate. So obviously, whatever the approved flight manual says that you're going to do, you're going to do. But for test purposes, you're going to motor the engine. And that's just to get rid of any fuel that's puddled at the bottom of the engine. That's not too bad. However, what could be bad is a hot start or a hung start. So if we look at these three gauges, you could have an RPM gauge and an EGT gauge and a fuel flow gauge and you start the steps. One is the starter on. The next thing you're going to do is ignition on and then the third one is going to be fuel nozzles on and of course that's going to be typically at about 20 percent and when you turn that on it's possible, you know, the EGT is going to have a red line. The EGT might start rising. Of course, fuel flow is going to go up from zero as well, and hopefully RPM continues up. If you see that it looks like that the temperature is going to exceed the red line, before it hits the red line, you need to do something about it. The number one thing you do, well, I guess I should tell you the definition of a hot start. The definition of a hot start is during start... the EGT exceeds red line. That's the definition of a hot start. What do you do about it is a two-step process and you need to do it in this order. Fuel nozzles have to be turned off and motor the engine if possible. 
Now you're going, what do you mean, if possible? Well, I'm going to cover it in detail here shortly. But there are some times on some engines where if, uh, for instance, you've come up to 40% and you've let go of the starter motor and you're above 40% and that's when the hot start occurs, there are on some engines you cannot re-engage the starter motor if you've already let go of the switch. There are some engines that even if you have let go of the starter motor, you can push back down on the button. And of course, any engine, if you're below 40% or you know whatever number it is for your engine to let go of the starter, if you haven't let go of the starter motor yet, you can certainly continue to motor the engine around. So in every case, fuel nozzles need to be turned off and that'll stop any more heat getting into the engine and then motoring the engine if possible is spinning the compressor around and blowing cold air through the engine to cool it down as fast as possible you need to do both of these things now granted this is the most important order and I'm going to expect you to know that you got to turn the fuel nozzles off first and then motor the engine if possible but if you're a really good jet pilot you're going to be doing these simultaneously Hunk start. A hunk start, the definition of a hunk start is during start, the RPM fails to accelerate to idle. Now, just like the hot start may more likely occur right after you turn on the fuel, a hot start could occur any time during the starting sequence. That's why it says during start. A hung start could occur any time during the, during the starting sequence. The most likely time is, although a hot start, the most likely the time is when you first turn on the fuel. A hung start, the most likely time is when you let go of the starter switch. So you start the, you know, number one is start, or is starter on, number two is ignition on, number three is fuel nozzles on, and then of course number four is EGT monitor. And that's the reason that's there is because we're monitoring for a hot start. And that RPM, 20%, when we get up there and we turn on the ignition and the fuel, that's the most likely time the EGT is going to exceed redline. Not the only time, but the most likely time. Then we're going to keep going up past the self-accelerating speed up to about 40%, whatever the operating handbook says, where we can let go of the starter switch. Well, we've been adding energy due to the starter, and at 20% we're adding energy due to the fuel, and we're letting go of the starter switch, so the starter's not adding energy anymore. So it's going to be a little harder for the engine to accelerate without the starter, which is why the most likely time for a hung start is when we let go of the starter motor, and the most likely time for a hot start is when we first turn on the fuel. But a hung start could occur any time. In fact, we could get up to 18% and not even have turned on the ignition and the fuel, and if the engine won't accelerate, then that still meets the definition of a hung start. It could happen while we have the starter on. It could happen right when we turn it off. And of course, as long as it happens before idle, then it's still a hung start because it's during the starting sequence. If it doesn't get up to idle, then we're going to have to do something about it. Something is wrong. Now, the problem with a hung start is that if the, as the RPM is rising, if it stagnates and it stops and it doesn't go any higher, then we're not going to get as much cooling air getting blown through the engine by the compressor. We need that compressor spinning up as rapidly as possible to blow cooler air into the combustion section so when we burn fuel we don't have air hitting the turbine section that's too hot. If that compressor isn't spinning as fast as it's supposed to because it's hung up, because it's stopped accelerating, then it's possible that the temperature inside the combustion chamber may get too hot. That is, a hung start might turn into a hot start, and a hot start is going to could damage the engine. So what do you do about it? Number one and number two is the f fuel nozzles off and motor the engine if possible. That is the steps to take.
What do you do about a hung start? Are identical to that of a hot start. That because a hot a hung start may turn into a hot start because the compressor isn't spinning around very fast anymore. So we want to preclude or keep engine damage from occurring. So if we have a hung start, what are we going to do? The same thing if we have a hot start. Fuel nozzles off, motor the engine if possible. Now you got to remember, the worst thing you can do to start a motor, I mean to a jet engine, is to start it. But we're going to do that every single time we operate the engine. And guess what? The most easy time, the most likely time to damage an engine is during the starting sequence and having a hot start or having a hung start that turns into a hot start. So you've got to be on your toes. Unlike a piston engine like in a 172 or in your car, when the starter starting sequence goes bad, what do you do? You let go of the switch. It's almost impossible to hurt a piston engine during the starting sequence. With a jet engine, it's exactly the opposite. If something goes wrong, you're probably going to need to hold the starter switch down or re-engage the starter. Your level of uh, attentiveness needs to go way up during the engine start, especially when something goes wrong. You don't just stop doing something. You have to be proactive. You have to turn the fuel nozzles off. You have to motor the engine if it's at all possible. So that's a big change going from piston engines to turbine engines. Torching is a thing that happens during start and most of the time it's no big deal. You gotta understand when we're accelerating that engine and at 20% uh, at 0% starter on, at 20% ignition on, fuel nozzles on, and then of course EGT monitor, uh, right at this point in here the engine is, you know, if idles at 50%, the engine's not really designed to run down here between 20 and 50%, yet we have the fuel burning. So it's not going to act as well, act as good as we'd like it to. It's possible that there might be some extra fuel that didn't get evaporated, and it's burning as it leaves the engine, and so you see a small flame coming out of the engine. That's what torching is. It's okay to have a little torching as long as it goes away by the time you get to idle. And of course, it's okay if your EGT doesn't exceed redline, as long as the EGT doesn't get up there and it stops doing it by the time you idle. Uh, most of the time, if it does occur, it lasts for a second or two, and then it's over. If it lasts after you know, of more than several seconds or last after you get to idle, then it's a problem. Then you need to shut the engine down. Something's wrong. Like I said earlier, there's two uh, very, very popular types of starter motors. And in fact, on civilian airplanes, you're only going to run across these two types. A starter generator, it runs off of electricity and is a starter. It converts electrical energy into horsepower during start. And then once you get the engine started, you flip a switch and it turns it into the generator. The other type of starter is a pneumatic starter or an air turbine starter. And it runs off of compressed air. So starter generators. You're going to find these on small business jets, small turboprops, and small turbine-powered helicopters. Small turboprops, small business jets, and small turbine helicopters. That is, the engine is small enough, the turbine engine is small enough, so you can put on the accessory section this DC starter generator and they're commonly referred to as DC starter generators because that's a lot different than AC and the starter generator produces power and sends it through the accessory section to the main shaft of the engine and that's what gets it spinning around and the reason these are small turboprops, small business jets and small turbine powered helicopters is that the engine is small enough so that the weight of the starter motor, and of course we have to have a battery, and of course we have to have a battery cable going to it, that the weight of the starter and the battery and the cable is not too much. As soon as we get into big turboprops, big business jets, and big turbine powered helicopters, then it's a different story. We're going to find a lighter weight way to get the engine started. So, like I said, during start, 
it runs off a of direct current that's coming out of the battery or a ground power cart with batteries on it. Um, and that's almost always 28 volts DC, just like in the 172. And here's a picture of one. This, these splines right here, that's what goes into the accessory section. So if here's the accessory section coming off of the engine, and here's the shaft coming in, here's going to be the starter motor, and this shaft goes into the accessory section and connects with it. This shaft with these splines on it cannot ex go in or go out. It's always stuck in. This starter motor shaft always goes into the accessory section, and there's no way in the cat cockpit for you to move this in or out. This starter generator is always engaged into the accessory section, which works out great, because during start, we run uh, power from the starter motor to spin the accessory section, and then the rest of the time, we take power off of this accessory section, and we spin this DC starter generator so it'll produce electricity. So there's not any good reason to have to disconnect it. And like I said a minute ago, it's either you're going to use the battery off of the airplane or you can have GPU. That stands for ground power unit. And that could be an engine with a DC generator on it, or it could be a cart with a whole bunch of batteries in it hooked together. I think that's what we got out of the flight line. The ground power unit is just a bunch of batteries, but either onboard the airplane or external power would be another way to describe it. And then again, in the cockpit, after you get the engine running, you're going to flip the generator switch on, and that converts the DC starter generator to a DC generator. Interestingly enough, DC generators and DC starter motors, the insides are essentially identical, which makes it really, really easy to do that. Nice thing is, is that it saves weight. We don't have to have a separate starter and a separate generator, so it does tend to save weight. That's kind of a nice advantage. And since the generator, the shaft coming out of it is always hooked up to the engine. That means that we can always re-engage the starter. For example, let's say that we start the engine, or we're in the middle of a start, and we turn on the ignition and we turn on the fuel nozzles at 20 percent, and we'll just say at 30 percent we're watching the exhaust gas temperature and the needles rise and rise and rise and it's almost going to hit the exhaust gas temperature red line for start. So we think we're having a hot start. So one, fuel nozzles off. And two, motor the engine if possible. And since we still have the starter switch depressed, we're going to hold it down. Of course, we're going to turn the fuel nozzles off, and we're going to hold it down so the compressor will spin around and around and around, blow cold air through the engine, so hopefully the EGT will come down. The nice thing about a DC starter generator is that if we come up to 40%, the engine's accelerating, we come up to 40%, and we let go of the starter switch, because 40% is generally speaking where you let go of the starter switch, and the engine's still coming up to 50%, and then... That's when the EGT starts rising like crazy and we think we're having a hot start. We can, if it's a DC starter generator, even though we've let go of the starter switch at 40%, we can push the switch back down because the shaft from the starter is still engaged with the gears inside of the accessory section and it's not going to hurt anything. So what does it allow? It allows you to re-engage the starter motor even if you've already let go of the switch you can re-engage the starter motor even after even oops even after you've let go of the switch so that's great that means no matter where it is during the starting sequence if you have a hot start because the EGT is rising too much you can re you can do number two you can motor the engine Of course it takes a lot of power a lot of power out at the airport those beach 1900s they have a Pratt & Whitney PT6 engine on them they have about a thousand equivalent shaft horsepower if you read in the pilot operating handbook it's gonna say it needs 800 amps out of a ground power unit at 28 volts. 
That's a lot of amps. That's a lot of amps. Duty cycle. DC starter generators. If you look on the inside of those things, it's a whole bunch of wires. If you run electricity through the wires, these wires are going to get hot. That's part, uh, as long as those wires have a little bit of resistance, some of the electrical energy is going to stay in the wires in the form of heat. So just like an ignition system, it's typical for starter motors, that is DC starter generators, to have a duty cycle. And it could say you can run it for 30 seconds, one minute off, 30 seconds on, one minute off, 30 seconds on and then it may say 30 minutes off because the starter motor is actually getting too hot and you'll melt the insulation inside of it you will destroy the starter motor just for fun one time uh, the last school I taught, I taught at we had HH 52 helicopters 